Near to Castle Donington, which lies 12 miles southwest of Nottingham and 7 miles southeast of Derby, a site was selected for a large power station designed to assist in meeting the nation's post-war electrical power shortage. This picturesque village, which has a population of 3,140, is recorded in the Doomsday Book as Donitone and derives its prefix from a castle which once stood on a hill to the southeast of the River Trent. The site chosen for the station is bounded on the west by the River Trent, on the north by the main railway line, and has an area of approximately 200 acres. The consent of the Ministry of Fuel and Power to proceed with the construction was given in December 1951 and work on the main foundations began soon afterwards. Test borings taken previously on site showed the substrata to be sufficient to carry the heavy loads imposed by such a project, thus making the site eminently suitable for its purpose. It was evident that the problem of housing a large number of workmen would be beyond the scope of the village and hutments were constructed to provide living accommodation and facilities for their social welfare on the actual site. This diagram shows the scheme for the circulating water system which entails a large amount of underground civil work in the early stages of construction. Excavation is commenced for the river intake where large coarse screens will be constructed to screen the 25 million gallons of water which will pass through the culverts each hour. These twin gravity culverts are to be 13 feet wide and 6 foot 6 inches high. The system being so designed that each will be a standby to the other. The base and side walls are constructed first and pre-stressed concrete roof beams are placed in position. This is followed by a cement rendering before backfilling takes place. These chambers are being constructed to house the 72 inch wide fine screens which are of the mechanically driven band type. Pen stocks will be installed in order that the chambers can be isolated for maintenance purposes.
A fence stock has now been placed in position and the operating mechanism will follow in due course. This stone pitching is being placed into position in order to minimize the erosion of the river bank at times of high water level. The main intake is now equipped with fine and coarse screens. Wash water pumps are provided for removing the trash which is collected in the screening process. This is the first stage in the construction of the pump house for the circulating water. The suction pipes for the main pumps can be seen in position. The built-in suction and delivery pipes have to be accurately positioned and securely fixed to prevent possible movement during pouring of the concrete. Reinforced concrete is again used for the construction of both the substructure and the superstructure of the pump house. The type of substrata met in the excavation work can now be seen and it is interesting to note that some 335,000 cubic yards were excavated on the main building site. Sixty-inch bore circulating water pumps will draw water from this suction chamber and deliver it through the pressure culverts to the turbine room where it divides off to each condenser. The pump house contains the six circulating water pumps with suction and delivery valves. The pump motors develop over 1,300 horsepower each. Smaller pumps for feeding the firefighting equipment are also housed in the basement. In addition, separate pumps deliver the water after heating through the main condensers to the cooling towers via this pressure culvert. The details of construction and method of reinforcement being very clearly shown. As a preliminary to the construction of the tower, the site for the tower pond is leveled. And cord piles driven for the ring beam, which will support the main tower shell and encloses the tower pond.
The outlet from the pond feeds direct to the circulating water pump intake culvert so that when one or more cooling tower pumps are in operation in times of low river flow, the quantity of water drawn from the river will be automatically reduced. Work has advanced on the casting of the central discharge column and the tower legs, which will support the concrete shell 210 feet in diameter. Ring after ring of concrete will be poured in the succeeding days until the cooling tower reaches its ultimate height of 300 feet. Four such shells of reinforced concrete, six inches thick, will be constructed with the provision for a fifth tower should the nature of the generating load demand it. In the base of the tower, treated wooden laths are fitted. Water is discharged from the center column to hundreds of jets and allowed to fall on these laths which break up the water into tiny droplets. Air is drawn in between the tower legs and the droplets are cooled as they fall into the pond below. These towers are fitted with film pack eliminators which are designed to reduce carryover of vapor and prevent nuisance in the surrounding area. We now move to the main building, to the site of the turbine room where work has advanced to the stage where the circulating water pressure pipes have been laid for number one machines. The excavation for these pipes and the method of backfilling presented a peculiar civil engineering problem as they are to lie beneath the main turbine foundation block and any uneven settlement in this area would be disastrous. The difficulty was overcome by using colloidal concrete which in simple terms means the placing in position of stone aggregate and pumping liquid cement to fill the spaces between the aggregate. Part of the aggregate can be seen in position also the stress wires which are being cast into the base. The size of the stone filling can here be clearly seen, also the method of placing in position. At the central concrete mixing plant, the cement and sand, or the liquid grout, as with all the materials, are measured with great care.
After thorough mixing, the liquid grout is pumped to the turbine room basement. Flexible pipelines are connected to these vertical pipes and pumping will continue over the whole area until the spaces are completely filled. The workman is seen testing the depth of pour by removing plugs from weep holes in the shuttering. Whilst this work is progressing, the foundations are prepared for the steelwork for the main building. Pile caps are formed on the cord piles in preparation for the machine bases for the main stanchions. These machine bases are set to the correct level with great accuracy. The correctness of the main steelwork will depend upon the accuracy of their setting. The holding down bolts are already positioned and the plate is ready to receive the stanchions. The stanchions are of the all welded box type construction and here we see one of the lower sections of the turbine room being slung ready for placing on its prepared base. This type of construction is used extensively throughout the main building. The hollow construction allows of access for maintenance after erection. Internal ladders are provided for this purpose. This feature is also made use of in the erection process, as will be seen later. The nuts are removed from the holding down bolts and the stanchion is lowered into position. The holding down bolts are tightened and the machine base ensures correctness of alignment. After the lower vertical sections have been securely fixed, the horizontal members are lifted into position. The erector's mate can be seen inside the member.
brackets have already been riveted onto the main columns to receive these members and have been given the usual coat of paint. The beam is lowered into position and fish plates are bolted on. The erector's mate inside the member pushes bolts through from the inside and nuts are placed on these bolts from the outside. The erector's mate will make his exit through escape holes specially provided. The foregoing scenes are typical of the method of construction, which becomes increasingly hazardous as the framework increases in height. The boiler house roof being 150 feet above basement level and the turbine house roof 86 feet above basement level. The arrival of the side members for the 36-ton turbine house crane is an important event. The crane will consist of two such members and will later play a most important part in the erection of the plant in the turbine room. This light duty crane will be in great demand during the erection of the turbo alternator, feed pumps, heaters and pipe work as even the comparatively small components require the assistance of the crane during their erection. A beam has been incorporated in the roof design to assist in hoisting the side frames onto their bogies.
the bogies can be seen in position on the crane rail. After the side frames are fixed, the crab will be added and later the control equipment. A further crane of 150 tons capacity will be installed later to deal with the heavier components such as the electrical stator which weighs 140 tons in its wound state. The exterior design of the building is unusual in its character skillful use being made of asbestos sheeting instead of the more conventional type of brickwork covering. The principle underlying this decision being that it is uneconomical to construct a building to last for 100 years when the life of its contents is only about 30 years. And after that period, the design of the building is usually not suitable for any newer type of equipment. The lower section is formed of three inch pre-cast concrete slabs faced with granite chippings. Special attention has been given to the window design to give ample natural lighting. The runway beam at roof level is to carry a bosun's chair for window cleaning and replacing any asbestos sheets which may get broken. The whole design is light and pleasing in its character. The internal treatment is also carried out in asbestos sheeting and in order to reduce the nuisance from the noise of the machines, acoustic tiling is used on the inner face. The completion of the first section of the external cladding allows work to proceed on the casting of the block for the turbo alternator and here we see the shuttering in position for the block for number one machine. <laughs> 